she is the most caring individual with the heart that's as big as this world. She is a strong, strong woman. And she is the best mother in the world. She loves to play bridge, but this day, the cards were dealt so differently. It was a quiet morning, and I hate to use the word quiet, because that normally means something bad is going to happen. She was going to play bridge with a friend of hers. Her friend blacked out, and they hit a parked car on Monument Avenue, going about 45 to 50 miles an hour. The call was a motor vehicle accident. We found ALS Code 3, Monument Avenue, and Stillwell Road. She actually called 911, and she goes, I told him to come quick, I was bleeding. We were rolling up onto the scene um, really before we had any other additional information. And as we were rolling past uh, the vehicle, I think all of us at that point knew that this wasn't just a run in the mill traffic accident that we were walking into. Mom, being the passenger, got the blunt of it. Uh, just from the moment that you opened the, the passenger door where Ms. Wallerstein was sitting, you could tell that this is a sick person that we need to get to definitive care as soon as possible. Andrew called and said it was serious because originally I was taking care of the driver. He hollered at me and I learned, looked over and saw the black and blue and the, the swelling and I knew that we had something extremely serious and life-threatening. She was clutching her cell phone in her left hand. I remember that. You could see some of the skin tears and stuff up her arm. But the thing that she kept saying over and over was, please help me, I can't breathe. At that point, it became urgent that we got her into the back of the ambulance. She had attention pneumothorax, and that is a life threat. And she will die in a couple of minutes, unless it's corrected. Andrew looked at me and said, uh, there's absent lung sounds. And I quizzically and he says, I need to dart her. I said, yes. And he went ahead and prepared to, to dart, which is to get the air out of the, that particular area so she could start breathing again. And the whole time, she was still conscious. Help me, I can't breathe. There was no question in our mind that we needed to get to VCU at the medical college as soon as possible. I received a phone call um, at work, and I got down to VCU, and I was met with um, a social worker and a chaplain. This was a pretty concerning story that it was an 80-year-old who had a lot of oxygenation problems. So the things that we were worried about is whether she can breathe on her own, whether her heart was going to work well enough, whether she was going to bleed out into her chest or her belly, whether she had intracranial bleeding that would be not treatable because she was on blood thinners that we may not be able to reverse quickly enough. Um, these are all major injuries that could be immediately life-threatening. So we had uh, the emergency medicine team and the anesthesia team involved in putting in the breathing tube. We had the trauma team involved in putting in the chest tubes. More uh, folks doing an ultrasound of her abdomen looking for signs of bleeding because she'd been on uh, blood thinners. Uh, bedside paramedics and nurses. And we had pharmacists thinking about, well, what kind of reversal agents should we be giving to, to make her blood not as thin as it was when she came in? And so all of these things are happening all together. And some people actually call it a little bit of a symphony because you have to bring it all together to try to get the patient the best possible care. I um, saw her briefly and told her that I loved her so much and to stay strong. As a mom, you do it, you can do it, stay strong. The doctors told us that they did not think she was gonna live through the night. She was really, really busted up. Little elderly lady, purple all over. It wasn't all hands on deck situation. I was the admitting nurse, but it took everybody. She had multi-system trauma. She had significant trauma to her head, to her spine, to her extremities, even to her abdominal area. There was evidence of blunt force trauma. We learned of mom's extensive in injuries, meeting with um, Dr. Abatanos. He was the chief trauma surgeon on a call. He started wheeling it off, and I don't even remember half of what he said because they were just one after another after another. Her left knee, you could see the inside of it. 
almost all of her ribs fractured. A lot of lung injury that uh, kept us busy for a while. She had so many different areas of her body that were injured. She had this inflammatory response um, that really was significant. You know, her chest size had increased until she looked like a, you know, could have been a linebacker. I thought her chance of survival was pretty low. You know, it's three o'clock and I'm trying to make four o'clock go well so that she'll be here at five o'clock. We're on three different blood pressure medications. Her pressures were dropping. She um, was on the ventilator and tubes and um, struggling. So my role um, for her was to take a look at the major geriatric syndromes. So those are pain control, um, delirium or confusion while someone's in the hospital, um, medication management, looking at polypharmacy and different medications that are being used for different reasons, and then transitions of care. Uh, the geriatric service um, has become near and dear to my heart. Um, Dr. Hopgood and her team uh, are becoming so much more uh, significant as we're seeing more and more patients uh, who are elderly who are victims of trauma. The hard part was seeing her in so much pain and seeing her struggle to breathe. The respiratory therapy was huge in her because of her significant chest trauma. And there were times she was, I felt like she was giving up. And you know, if, if your patient gives up, you, you've got a tough road to hoe. I try to tell all of my patients and their families, trauma is like a roller coaster. We don't know what's around the corner. I cannot tell you how this is going to end, but we're gonna ride it. They kept us informed. They were very patient with us when we had tons of questions. They showed us the CT scan. They showed us the x-rays. Her family was at the bedside and they were uh, acting as, as really great advocates and very concerned about her um, anxiety and her pain control and making sure she was comfortable and understanding that she may not survive. This family was understanding about, you know, I can't, you know, we were talking to them and having them there as, as all, you know, with every move. It was when I called her Dodo that I could get a response out of her. We'd get her stable and then she'd be unstable. And, um, it, things kind of went circular for quite a while. She had multiple orthopedic teams. She had teams for her clavicle. She had teams for her extremity injuries. Um, she had a spine team for her lumbar spine fracture. So coordinating all of these specialists um, was really a challenge, but you need everybody's expertise. I gave report to uh, another one of our nurses here, and I said, you know, getting pretty attached to this one, so if anything big happens, you know, if you have time, please let me know. I got a call, it's nine, nine or 10 o'clock at night, Dodo got off the epidrip, and we just kind of celebrated. Soon after that, we were able to take her to surgery, you know, once she was off those really powerful medications, and we were able to coordinate to have the multiple surgeries done at one time to minimize her risk. Which was great. We didn't want her to go back under anesthesia time and time again. You know, we were all kind of waiting together almost on pins and needles. What's the update? When's she coming back? That surgery that was supposed to be four, four and a half hours was over seven hours. The brace allowed her to sit up in the bed, which was very important for her respiratory status. Just to be able to sit up in the bed is an amazing thing. She would take a couple of steps forward and then she would take a step back. And there were a couple of times where we were really optimistic and we thought at one point we were gonna get the breathing tube out and then she would get a pneumonia. I said to her many times, we've gotta get you back to playing bridge. Come on, let's get going, let's get up, let's walk. You know, on days she didn't feel like it, she would still go for it. You know, she always, she'd give you that look of, I don't really feel like doing this, but I'm gonna do this. <laughs> When 
Toto got here, she was still quite ill. She was having a lot of trouble breathing on her own. She was requiring a lot of respiratory support. Had some anxiety around all of her injuries and what she had been through. And so we just took it sometimes hour by hour, day by day. I think she had a lot of generalized weakness and pain with breathing on her own. It was just more of pain medication management, getting into the mindset that this was possible from respiratory to pharmacy to nursing to speech therapy to our care partners. This is Project Betty. We're going to make this happen. We kind of monitor and try little breaks off of the ventilator each morning to see how she can do and then trials throughout the day. I went in with the attitude of, regardless of whatever her situation was, we're going to find a positive. I know she was probably fearing for her life, feeling like she was not going to make it through this. She was very frustrated because she couldn't talk. and She had no way to communicate. So yes, she did end up with depression. And I knew that that wasn't my mom talking when she said she wanted to go. Dodo was so afraid of what was going on that her anxiety was just driving a lot of everything that, that was happening. And trying to abate that anxiety, we had her on a small dose of medicine a couple times a day. Betty's world was really consumed with the hospital at that point in time. Her family had made lots of overtures to her, and uh, some of what I was thinking of my role as another person that could bring the outside world to her and start to reach towards that part of Betty that was her inner self, her essential self. Once we were able to convince her that she was gonna be able to breathe on her own and be safe doing that, that that really took away a deep level of anxiety that she had. We had a clear vision of what her day was and every day I'd come in and be like, all right, today we're gonna to put you on a cruise ship schedule. From this time to this time, activities are weaning. From this time to this time, you get to rest in the bed. From this time to this time, you gotta be out of bed into the chair. One of the great things that everybody gets to do as they start weaning and things get better is, when do you get to talk again? And there's one day she was doing so well on the ventilator, the respiratory therapist, myself, the nurse, and the speech therapist were like, why don't we try her a speaking valve? I have a, a speaking valve that fits on in the tubing, essentially, and just redirects air from the mechanical ventilation up to vibrate her vocal cords. And it was a crystal clear voicing. She was, it was unbelievable. I will never forget that. We put that on, we're like, Betty, what's your name? Dodo! And it was just ridiculous to the point where we grabbed the nurse's phone and I forget which daughter that we called, but like, hey, I've got a surprise for you. I have a nickname. And she goes, hi, Bozy. I love you so much. And that was the first time I heard a voice in probably 10 weeks. That was just the best sound. To hear her voice and never heard her voice before, yeah. it felt like music to your ears. And I was just like, oh, and I just ran over there and hugged her. I was just like, talk to me, baby, talk to me. <laughs> Terrell would be in there and just talking to her. It was really just like this patient whisperer, just such a calming influence. And like they had like this really neat little relationship of, you know, like I look forward to seeing him. And he just took it as like, she's my grandma. I'm gonna take care of her. We stood one time and she was holding on. I was like, we doing a little dance. We doing a little dance. And you're always telling me, Salsa, she, she'll stand. And then I was like, see, look. And I dropped my hands down and she held. I said, look at you. I said, I thought you were weak. And she just was like, oh. Okay. The MARICU, their tireless, tireless efforts, as well as in the STICU, and their selflessness, they, it was a while, but they end up getting her off the vent. Most of her acute traumatic injuries had been actually resolved, the fractures were healed. Um, we were still working with the orthopedic surgeons, and the plastic surgeons, and the rest of the um, nurses and therapists to, to try to get her better. But it was really kind of moving her up that road to recovery is where we were now. She had a bunch of non-healing wounds, and they were a huge risk for infection. Under the direction of Dr. Poses with plastic surgery, we decided to utilize what's called ultrasound mist therapy, three sessions a week of about 15 to 20 minutes 
um, her session on her wounds to help stimulate healing. When I took care of her, we were working on getting her back on nutrition. She did still have her feeding tube and she was getting tube feeds, but we were slowly introducing back um, regular food. They're at a point now where they're off the machines and they have to really work. They have to really work on deep breathing and we're there to encourage them. You could tell she wanted to go home. She was work she worked very hard for us. She she did everything that we had asked her to do. Physical therapy was involved greatly as she was just starting to get on her feet. Um, and they would come work with her every day and get her up to the chair. Um, that was a big struggle for her because she had been bed bound for so long. She had a great attitude throughout everything she had been through. Um, I could tell that she was going to make a full recovery. She had um, had been depressed, had, had struggled, but she'd fought, fought through it. And when I was taking care of her, um, she'd really started to turn the corner, was eating a lot more and really excited and ready to go to rehab. So she stayed at rehab about six weeks, and there she learned to walk again. Betty definitely required a team approach, and I feel like that's something that Westport could offer. She had needs for an occupational therapist to work on trying to strengthen and increase her range of motion in her dominant right arm, which she couldn't use for quite a while. Physical therapy and occupational therapy also worked together to try to improve her endurance. Speech therapy worked with her um, tirelessly to try to improve her swallowing. She went from not being able to swallow at all to being able to eat a regular diet with thin liquids. She also had a significant wound on her leg and our wound care team was able to heal that wound before she left, allowing her to be able to go home. So over time we were able to build up her strength and her endurance. Once we were able to move her arm, we were able to get her active range of motion back um, and she just took off. She just blossomed. She was so proud of herself, and she, she's like, I can do it. I said, I know you can do it. You can do it. You've done it. You've done it. She blew us all out of the water when we watched her walk out of here and go home that day, and she was determined to do it, too. She wasn't going to be held back. She walked to the door, and she says, I just want to sit in my chair <laughs> with her southern accent. <laughs> she didn't give it up, so we didn't give it up. You know, we have to save a life. <laughs> and that's what we did. When we get to see the benefits of the work that we do, um, it really makes it all worth it. I think the biggest thing was that just in, in the face of such adversity, she didn't, she didn't give up. Another key component, aside from the medical care and surgical care that she received, is, is the role her family played. I mean, I think it was vital. Um, they were her advocates. They were there with her every step of the way. You get to see them walk out the door and go home. It's a beautiful thing. It's one of the reasons I like being here. Just to see her smile was really, really meaningful, really wonderful. And I told her, I said, when you get out of here, I said, you owe me a dance. And when you look into this camera and you see the video, <laughs> you know you owe me a dance and I hope, hopefully the music comes on after this. So get ready. Things are wonderful. Thanks to each and every person that was involved with Mom's health care. That's why we're here today. We just cannot thank them enough. Nice beer.